Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, world class drummer and educator Larry Aberman. And now, Rich Redman. What is up? Rock and Rollers, Rich Redman here with my co-host, Jim McCarthy. We're bringing you the yep. good stuff. We're talking about all things music, motivation, and success for another episode of the Rich Redman Show. And today's guest, coming from Las Vegas, my friend, Larry Aberman. How are you, buddy? Great. He looks Doing like he's good. coming from his, his drum room, man. Yeah. Now, I'm going to brag on you, buddy. I'm going to brag on you because I'm trying to figure out the best way to encompass all the different facets of your, of your career, but you're a world-class touring and recording drummer. You're a world-class educator, and just some of the people that you've played with, Jonathan Brooke, who we had on the show, whose episode's going to be coming out, Nile Rogers, Foreigner, Joe Sample, David Lee Roth, Rick Ocasek, Duran Duran, the list goes on and on. You're teaching at UNLV. Those kids are so lucky. I mean... Bravo, man! What a career! I'm so glad we get to talk to talk about it today. I'm man, thank you. I'm just grateful to be here. It's just good to see you, man. Yeah, you know, we're uh, you guys. it's just to be engaged. <laughs> <It's, I don't laughs> know. Right? What's it like out there? <laughs> yeah, because Jim used to live good in Las question, Vegas. Um, yeah. You know, when the pandemic first hit, it was really eerie because you know they shut the strip down and uh the first few nights they shut all the lights off which was never been done before you know the it was kind of a weird thing like they said okay we're going to shut the casinos and and the joke was like does anybody have a key or do those casinos have a lock to, to lock them up because they've never been closed right they're open 24 hours so they made a mistake actually so they, they created this uh dark you know strip so within a couple of days they started lighting it up again um now at this I, we were driving on a strip the other day and there's a lot more a lot of people walking around there's a lot of people coming through now you know so what's it like i mean i live in the suburbs you know <laughs> so yeah. i don't really see that junk <laughs> You know, yeah, I, it had to it had to be eerie for like a, another city that never sleeps, and of course, Kara's parents live out there, so right, right. Henderson, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a nice view of the city up there. Yeah, it yeah, really is. Part. Yeah. So your relationship? Oh, go ahead, Jim. How's Aliante? Has that developed uh, pretty well? It sure has. I mean, everything's developed pretty well. I mean, I don't know. I keep hearing like there's two million people here out out here now. And, Oh my yeah, gosh. When, when Aliante started, right, that was probably around 2003, 2002. Right. right yeah, when we now got it's, it's completely developed. You know, it's an outpost. I mean, you know, from where I lived to go to Henderson, it could, could take a good 45 minutes to an hour. Wow. Or more with traffic. So that's wow, a really? Big city, man. <laughs> Is traffic getting worse? Yeah, not like Nashville. I've well, now I was out there. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, traffic out there traffic. when I was there was getting hairy. You know? Yeah, no, it's if you had to catch that rush hour, you know, it, it, it's you're just sitting, just like anywhere else. Yeah, it doesn't it bother me. It ain't L.A. and it ain't. Hey, New York. <laughs> if you could drive in L.A., man, you can handle it anywhere. So that's what brought you to to Vegas was that you were the drummer in Cirque du Soleil's Humanity, right? For 16 years, and I asked you how many shows you did. You're like, man. 7,500. Yeah. And I was like, wow. And I thought I played Hicktown a lot. You know, you never know. Maybe I played Hicktown that many times. I don't know. That's a lot of work. That's what you call a steady job. No, it, in every sense of the word. Yeah. I cherished it. To be quite honest, you know, uh, like I went to university for school, uh, music, uh, went to music school and, uh, you know, highly trained, whatever. Went to a really good school, the Eastman School of Music. That's very, and, uh, very good. Before yeah. I yeah. got this humanity gig, I was lamenting to a lot of people, like, I'm, this just really pisses me off that, you know, I, I, I went to a top university and I, I, I would like to have like a corporate gig. <laughs> just know I have a job to show up. And, uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, I'm not saying, hey, be careful what you wish for. 
because I got it in spades. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it worked out great. It worked out great. You know, I met my wife there uh, on the job and then we started having kids and that type, you know, family and all that stuff to be home. And, and uh, it, it was, it, it was what a blessing. You know, really yeah. not traveling. And because before then I was touring, you know, uh, a lot. And I toured right through 9 11. And, you know, to get a job in 2003 where I could just sit down and not get on those planes, because it got pretty mm. hairy. You know, anyways, yeah. flying around at that time was it just, it still sucks. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I believe I saw open night, uh, opening night of Zoomanity, and there was right. this massive party afterwards. And I had a band called Rushlow, and we were like, a, you know, six guys wearing overpriced dress shirts um, playing country pop music. Um, and it was, it was a fun time. And we had a night off in Vegas, and I guess we talked to the right person, and we got tickets to the show. And it was very racy, which was very fun. But yeah. listening to the music and the band, I mean, you got to play a lot of styles. Uh, 12-8, brushes, swing, dance music, rock, a lot of styles. Yeah, no, you nailed it. I mean, the thing that happened when we did that show was, you know, Cirque du Soleil would bring in a lot of uh, people that they felt were talented, that they could help create the vibe. And, and especially with the music, you know, we were involved heavily in the orchestration and arrangement and everything. And so it would come down to grooves. You know, when you do a, a recording project, a lot of times the guy brings in the demo, but uh, you know, and then the vibe of what it's going to be is discussed. So it could be any kind of groove. And uh, with Zumanity, they really wanted me to, to bring everything I could. So yeah, any, I, and I play a lot of different styles and, you know, music and, uh, they embraced it. And so also I wrote my own drum parts. Yeah. And, uh, it was a pretty dance. You saw it was a pretty dance oriented show. It was acrobatic driven, but a lot of dancing. So the drums are important, you know, yeah. in a show like that. so yeah, it was fun. It was so you helped create the drum part and, and then and would the you read it for a while or would you just, <laughs> Uh, no. no, you know, every once in a while we get a sketch, uh, um, but no, you, you know, you play a couple times in rehearsal, and, uh, you know, and after a couple of days, you just know it. And and we, we played two shows a night, man. So, you know, I, I never had a book. And the craziest thing is today, if I think about it, I don't remember any of the music. That's crazy. What? Hmm. Now, is that your Zumanity kit behind you that you're at right now? Uh, no, no, that's in the, this is a, this studio, this one I just use, um, for recording. Then it's all mic'd up and it yep. sounds, it's a cherry, uh, you know, uh, not solid cherry, but the cherry plies, oh, yeah. uh, GW. And on the other side is another kit. Cause I, when I used to teach live lessons, <laughs> you know, um, and that's a uh, purple heart. DW. Beautiful. Yeah. They sound they, well, they both sound amazing. So. Well, they take amazing care of you because you've been such a, you were an early, early adapter of DW drums, were you not? I was, so early. I was definitely their first New York signing. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. That's, that's irrefutable. Yeah. I was doing this TV show on VH1 network and the, uh, and, well, and that really warranted getting a drum endorsement, you know, TV is like, <laughs> and, um, no one had heard DW in in, uh, in New York. Uh, the first guy that marketed them or brought them there was uh, uh, Grappa Man. Uh, uh, oh, Marco Sicola! Yay! Marco. Yeah. At the hey, hey Larry and at the uh, Sam Ash. Um, so, but yeah, I was the first guy in New York that had them. Wow, that's a were you a Manny's a guy or a Sam Ash guy? <laughs> I was a Manny's. I was a Manny's guy for sure. Yeah. I mean, I would go, I would only go to Sam Ash to say hi to Marco because he was such a great guy. He still is. He's such an unbelievably enthusiastic, cool guy. You know? Beautiful personality. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's one of the reasons I love social media is to be able to see like what, like what's Marco doing? You know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah. posting stuff lately. It's just, Grappa Man, you're Larry. <laughs> I could just relive that. You know? <laughs> well, they call him Grappa Man because he would always be at all the trade shows and he would have these little sexy vials of grappa. And so for people that aren't in the know, grappa is kind of like all the weird parts of the grape. So it's almost like Italian moonshine. Yeah. And it, it'll get you. Oh, it'll get you. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> it does its job. <laughs> so Eastman School of Music, studying with John Beck as a yeah. young man, you are, I mean, that, that qualifies you to do a lot of things. So you're in the city that never sleeps, New York City. If you look at your list of all the wonderful people that you've played with, like if you want to be really methodical about this, Stevie Ray and Jimmy – Vaughn, Nile Rogers, Bernard Edwards, Wynton Marsalis. We got to talk about that. Yeah. Joe Sample, Layla Hathaway, Kelly Willis. I'm a big fan of her. Yeah. Travis Tritt, Aaron Neville, Adam Ant, Jeff Beal, the New York Philharmonic as a soloist. Yeah. Foreigner, David Lee Roth, Rick Ocasek, Ben Harper, Pete Yorn, Lionel Richie, Daniel Lenoir. I mean, where do you even start? What is the first job you get that starts the whole domino effect? Wow. Um, <laughs> geez, I, you know, the domino effect of like making hit records, like well, big records. Well, that's I the thing is that or... you're, you're a hit record guy. I mean, you played on the family style record for the Vaughn brothers. Uh, then you're on this Jonathan Brooke record, Steady Pull, that I go, who is that with this beautiful Bob Claremont drum sound? Yeah, that. Wow. Well, I mean, um, that TV show I mentioned, that was what put me at a different, uh, you know, I had been uh, doing some touring and uh, gigging around New York, all the clubs and playing in lots of bands. Um, but the TV show with Nal Rogers, um, it was just a show where we would play live uh, as a house band behind different artists, and then they would play a video of the artist. So it was a pretty extraordinary thing. And then from that, uh, Niall would hire me to play on different records. So a lot of different uh, and all over the map, you know. Amazing. Um, now, he's got a, a nice uh, Netflix documentary happening. Have you seen it? Niles? It's, it, yeah, Niles, where he talks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a performance, and then he talks about his work ethic and how a lot of oh. song structures came together. And Yeah, he's a huge, huge influence on me, you know. Um, it was crazy. Uh, when I was in high school, I used to come home and play to albums with the stereo just blasting and distorting, right? And one artist I love to play to is the Crusaders, and that's Joe Sample's group, right? Yeah. And so when I ended up playing with Joe Sample, it was like I had already knew all his everything. I just fit like a glove because it was, uh, yeah. And that, that's funny. It's like you reap what you sow. Like you were, yes. you were preparing to have that gig as a young man without even knowing it. No, absolutely not. And, and uh, you mentioned Lionel Richie, you know, what we did with him was pretty unbelievable. It was with Niall and it was his first, uh, Lionel wanted to record. He had kind of taken some time off. He had domestic issues. I don't know if you remember any of that stuff, but at any know. rate, he, uh, he came to New York to record music and he came to do something completely different. So he kind not completely different, but from what he had been doing. So he came to New York to work with Niall and play like funk, like Commodore's funk. Yeah. And it was amazing, amazing stuff. What we did never came to the light of day because we brought it, he brought it back to Motown and they went, this is amazing Lionel, but it's not Lionel Richie because he had become, you know, dancing on the ceiling, Lionel Richie. So the only reason I brought him up is because I remember sitting in the control room watching this guy sing, you know, on one of the, just a scratch book on one of the tracks. And I'm just in there, how the fuck did I get here? Because when I was a kid, you know, Easy Like Sunday Morning was one of the most beautiful, wonderful songs to me. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know, all kinds of stuff like that, man. Um, so, yeah, imaging for sure. I've had proof positive that, that, that you know, yeah, I'll sit there sometimes just look around like, how did this happen, you know? Yeah. Got so that, so that was one of those moments. And so oh then, you, then you're finding yourself in rooms with <laughs> Foreigner and Rick Ocasek. And then now the Family Style album with the Vaughn Brothers, that was a Grammy winner, was it not? Where's the Grammy? Yeah. Did, you get, did you get one? Where is it sitting? I got the plaque because, you know, you're not the artist. Yeah. I, they give you the, you, the um, it's like a... A parchment. <laughs> yeah, they cheap out on that. Uh, come yeah, on. Yeah, man, I want some hardware. No, it was. <laughs> well, you know what's crazy is uh, that Wynton Marcellus, you mentioned him. I, I did a, a recording with him while I was at Eastman with the Eastman Wind Ensemble. It was a classical recording, and that was nominated for a Grammy the year, uh, well, no, a few years before that, obviously, but I almost won a Grammy for that, like a classical record and then a blues record. <laughs> so. Yeah. But um, 
Well, you know, the Vaughn thing, I just thought of something that was pretty unbelievable. Uh, like the, how did I get here situation? Uh, after we finished the record, I went to, uh, he came, he was touring with um, Joe Cocker uh, and it was his last tour and they came through Jones Beach. So I went out to hang out with Stevie and just say, hey man, you know, <laughs> we had worked together a few months before and we were gonna be touring. Yeah. So I show up to soundcheck, I'm on the stage and Chris, uh, uh, drummer Layton, he, he turns around and goes, hey man, would you play my drums? Because I've never heard my drums. I've never heard us like in the house. Wow. No one, he never felt comfortable like who could play, you know, Stevie wouldn't want to play with anybody at Soundcheck, you know. So I played Soundcheck with Double Trouble and Stevie. And uh, damn. Yeah. And so Chris came back, said, oh man, it sounds great. Thanks, Larry Elk. And we actually just played Vaughn Brothers songs. Like Stevie wanted to play the new stuff, right? And I got off the drums and I just walked, I, I said, holy shit. <laughs> I just played with Double Trouble. <laughs> yeah, man. Chris yeah, Whipper Layton. Don't they call him the Whipper? Yeah. Cause Is that because he's got like, his whip in the backbeat? Oh, God, yeah. What a wicked shuffle. Yeah. Oh, I. you know, that's elusive to me, man. Just that finding that, that pocket. I don't get to play enough shuffles. I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm just, I think it's like such a thing of the past. Well, you know, for me, I teach, I'm teaching a lot of the university and whatnot, and, and uh, the shuffle is so important in the phrasing of jazz music. Sure. Shuffle up that triplet and the blues and all that. You know, yeah, traditional blues, I haven't done many blues gigs like that, but the blues, is, that's a whole other, man, we could spend three hours talking about the blues, how important they are and all that stuff. But I use the shuffle a bit generally... The boogie woogie shuffle, la ding 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 la. That's how I treat. How do you teach groove? That's a good question, right? You hear that all the time, right? I use that tool. It's not something I invented. My teacher Justin DiCiocio taught it to me, but that blues shuffle is the roots of every freaking. thing. Well, that's a nice. It's like a gateway drug to get kids into the jazz ride symbol pattern and trying to think in terms of of triplets, triplets and pulse. Just getting that, and which translate this translates so for in every music. Music doesn't have a good pulse, a good feel. Hmm. It ain't Pass. It. Exactly. You know. A, now is that also strengthening the left hand when you do the shuffle? To well, that yeah, well for sure. Well, that two-handed, you know, that's a whole other thing. That's true. I'm, I'm going to start pulling that out a little more, you know. <laughs> it's a good week. It's, it's fun. Warming, it, warming up, yeah. So is it the shuffle where you're going ding ga ding ga ding ga ding ga yeah. ding Or is it ding di ga di ding di ga ding Well, basically, uh, it's utilize. What I teach is something that Justin DiCiocio, my teacher in high school, taught us. And, and it, if you don't know Justin, I mean, he taught at the High School of Music and Art in New York. His students were like Steve Jordan, Omar Hakim. Wow. Uh, uh, Charlie Drayton. Is he is he still Cameron around? Coffey. Is he is he okay? Yeah, I just had him. I, you know, I'm I'm uh, assistant director at a jazz school out here. And Nevada brought him out uh, to do uh, Nevada School of the Arts. It's Nevada called. School of the Arts. I, I I dropped by. It was so fun. What did you drop? By? Did, I didn't. I drop by to one of the the high schools there. Oh, and, that's, that's Las Vegas Academy. That's the high school. Okay, so I oh, confu I confused those two. But it was that band that there was a student oh, yeah. band? It was credible. And then I picked up a shaker, and you picked. Yeah, up we were shaker. jamming. It was so great. It was so great. <laughs> that was the sec. I think that was the second band, Rich. Yeah, wow. that that school is high powered. Anyway, uh, we brought Justin out to do uh, Charlie Parker with strings. We did a live webcast, social distanced orchestra with in ears, and the whole thing it was kind of wacky. Um, so that was a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, I'm very much in touch with him, but his shuffle concept is uh, singing that boogie woogie, playing exercises. So it could really, it, there's a whole method behind it, but you basically line up what you're playing with what you're singing. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot more involved than uh, just, um, you know, playing a shuffle. Yeah. You know what I mean? The thing it also does with students is uh, you're singing the blues. You get that blues form. And, and, and a lot of times, drummers, we don't, we don't feel the form of music. We play beats. We don't play yeah. the music. So I have to get my students out of that immediately because, I, you know, I'm not that way. I, I have to – music has to be behind whatever I play. Yeah, we have to feel the, the, the harmonic structure. And the blues Absolutely. is the basis oh, yeah. for all things. 
Thank you. Hello. <laughs> it it I, really is. I wish you were at my some of my lessons because you know after a while, like your fourth hour, you're like. Da, 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 da. <laughs> You just broke it down. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Well, sometimes I'll stumble into some things like that, but man, I, you know, you're, you're such a great educator and the, you know, the kids at all the schools that are studying with you, they are getting the real deal where it's not some guy with a piece of paper with a bow tie. I mean, you have toured, you have recorded, you have won Grammys, you have insights. And uh, it makes me think about the school of rock, right, Jim, our sponsor That's right. of the show. Over 250 locations. Larry, you got them out there in Vegas, right? Yeah. No, I saw a bunch of my students that I'm kind of like a, what's the word? You know, I take them to the next step for, you know, okay, we got into ensemble playing and rock and, and that's a great vehicle. Now the kids that really want to become more complete musicians, learn about more things and harmonic structure, you know, drummers, they, you know, they're not learning a lot about that stuff. Yeah. They, they come see me and it's an augment. That's the word. <laughs> you're aug you're <laughs> augmentating. Is that right? I don't know, but I, I do Augmentary. know you're, 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 aug you're an augmentation of their music education. And, you know, um, Jim is like a killer slamming backbeat drummer, completely self-taught, love Neil, love the big kits, the whole deal. And I'm more of like an academic. All right, we're going to get out the Wilcox in book. We're doing the Jim Chapin book. We're going to learn. Book. all. Yep. But hey, you know, the, the, the music education, I'm a product of it, and uh, the kids can go over there to the School of Rock and they can learn how to play all instruments. And then they learn life skills like showing up on time, time management, setting goals, working as part of an ensemble, life skills that they're going to need. So if you're a parent in the Nashville area, we've got two locations, soon to be three locations. We've got one in Nashville, one in Franklin. There's going to be one in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. And there's two email addresses, and I always throw it to my co-host here. Jim, what are the email addresses to get your kids in the School of Rock? Nashville at schoolofrock.com or Franklin at schoolofrock.com. That's right. And you tell them that Jim, Rich, and Larry sent you. Absolutely. It's like the three stooges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Larry, when I talk to you, I'm in so in awe of your your gratitude and your humility. And you're like a secret weapon in the percussion industry. It's like um, you've done so, so much. And you, I never hear you pumping your chest or, you know what I mean? It's like you're, you're a secret weapon, man. You've accomplished so much. Yeah, I, I'm just feeling uh, incredibly grateful because the opportunities I was given uh, – the, the shit you dream about, you know, and um, I don't know why me, you know, sometimes, like I said, how did I get here? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Ed, thank you. <laughs> 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 if that's a good thing. Well, you, you got know, there because I, well, I, you have a perfect combination of, of raw talent that you developed and then you're, you're a humble, approachable person that can obviously take direction from people. I mean, you got, yeah. say you're in foreigner, right? And you got Lou Graham and, Ooh. and, and, and there, and you were, the, weren't you the first guy to replace Dennis? Yes. Elliot? Which is, which is okay. a really unenviable position. That's so tough. that's a story right there. Wow. Is well, it worth sharing? Can we share? Yeah, of course I can share. Well, you know, I'll share most of it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned a lot. I was 26, you know, and doing stuff and, and, and Mick was Jones was really good friends with Niall. And so that was pretty much why I got in there. And Mick was very happy, you know, on the first gig, he just, um, actually, you know how I got that gig? I forgot. It was, uh, Mick's guitar tech was Renee Martinez, uh, who was Stevie's guitar tech. And Renee went out to do Mick Jones. It was his first gig out since Stevie had passed. Um, and so when Dennis decided he wanted to leave, Mick, uh, Renee told him about me and then Nyla told him about me. So he brought me in. Um, but the challenge for me was I didn't understand what I understand now about taking direction, about knowing who the boss is. Ooh. And Mick was the boss. And I didn't quite get that. I was still in this kind of people pleasing thing. You know, tw I was 26, man, just get, I'm, and like, wow, I'm playing with Foreigner now. What the, f you know? <laughs> Feels and, like the first time, and you got to do it many times. Oh boy, boy, play! I just used to play that sh that gig with, with those shows with with Chill.
shows the whole freaking night because every song was a hit. Oh. Every song we played was a hit that I grew up with, right? So it was, I'm getting chills thinking about it. I mean, it was kind of freaky. I mean, I would but, love to go uh, bam, 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 spang, 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 spang. I got to tell you, <laughs> to get to get to get to oh, man. But anyway, so the point is this. Rick Wills was a bass player, and Rick, uh, Peter Frampton, and uh, all small, small faces. I can't remember, but the guy was a classic bass player, one of the cats, right? And between, it was Rick mostly. He would stand in front of the drum riser and start going, pull it back, pull it back, because he wanted it to sit more. And then I'd pull it back, and then Mick would come and go, up, up, up. <laughs> he wanted it to be a little oh, no. more. So He's the boss. Well, I didn't know that. I was dumb. I didn't get it. I was trying to please everybody. And the guys, some of the guys in the group that were younger like me, you know, was a hybrid at that point where some of the original, more original cats, they were trying to tell me, basically they're saying, just listen to Mick, do what Mick wants. But I still had this, oh, but I have to make everyone happy kind of thing. I don't know what it was. I didn't know who the boss was. Yeah. Yeah. Whose right. name is on the paycheck? Yeah. Who oh, signs the paycheck? Right? Didn't get it. Didn't get it, man. You well, know? yeah. I mean, I think at that a, at that age, if I'm trying to draw parallels between our lives, I 26, I uh, was one year out of North Texas with my masters and was kicking right. around Dallas, Texas, and was playing in horn bands and top forty bands, and everyone had something to say oh. about the time, feel, groove, and dynamics, and you are trying to cut through those suggestions like a knife, find out what the truth is, but I was trying to please everyone. The other problem is where you know, it's day to day. So Mick might be feeling it this way tomorrow, then yesterday it's different the next day. And Rick, and I'm paying attention to all those variables. Now I'll tell you something about uh, guys that, admi that I admire. Mark Schulman replaced me. Yeah. He work out with me. And he did the gig. You know what? I don't know how he read the lay of the land, but my man had an Akai drum machine with him and he played to a click track. Yeah. Back in 19, whatever is that? What is 92? You know, which was now it's standard, right? Everybody pulls out a click track. But he just, and, and nobody had a problem with it, I guess. But he well, came in, bam. He, he could see that this is not going to happen. <laughs> so we're just going to do this and be consistent. And it's funny. Say, no, 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 128. <laughs> I, I, I think that the, the uh, when my conversations with um, Mark were that he said, the crew guys knew that I had a click, but I kind of kept it secret from a lot of the guys in the band. Oh, and so that that way it's like but hey 128 is 128 whether you're jet lagged or you're 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 had too much monster energy well it, at least you're having some mode of consistency um but i'll tell you what when we started zoomanity the composer didn't want click tracks and organic organic and well and and i said our setup is we're all over the theater you know the drums are up here then this that and I said, we won't be able to pull this out, pull this off without a click track. But in my mind, I was thinking, I just want that consistency because <laughs> yeah. what, a shit, what a shit storm that would be, man. I mean, wow. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, the artist would just say, you know, one, one dancer would say, you know, my uh, number was really slow tonight. And say, nope, you just, you drank a lot of coffee or something because <laughs> same tempo. And there's there's really something about good. females in tempo, though. There's it's like I've worked with so many. I'm not even going to go. Nothing. They I are very <laughs> tuned into that. Yeah, it, it's just emotions, you know, tempo, vibe, you know, that stuff is uh, maybe more of a feminine side thing. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it would uh, it would be an issue if I didn't have just I don't know 128. <laughs> and I wasn't running the click on Zumanity, so if it was fast, it, I could say, hey, well, what was it? Was it right? <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? It was like the keyboard player or? Yeah, it was, it was the bass player most of the time. It just They, they ran uh, Ableton Live. So Now, what yeah. are a lot of these folks doing now that you were in the band with for 16 years? Are they, do they live in Vegas? Are they looking for the next opportunity? Yeah, well, the show is actually still running. I just left because I'd had enough. Um, but now, because of the pandemic, all the Cirque shows are, are down. Um, and I don't know, and nobody really knows what's going to come back up. That's kind of where, you know, 
I'm at with lots of different things in the music industry and in life, you know, it's like, how is this all going to reawaken? So I, you know, I can't speak for them, for them all. I don't know, but they're, they're waiting for the show to start up again. Yeah. So that's a, that's tough. Man. Jim, have you seen any uh, Cirque shows? Oh, several of them. I've seen, yeah. uh, when we went with the Vegas section, I was going to ask you about this. Some of the uh, musicians in Vegas, were you expecting like a, um, you know, a massive onslaught of uh, talent there? I mean, it's, it's, it, to me, it was surprisingly a talented pool of people out there that, that played the shows. Yeah. But then it got, I was only 25 at the time too. So what did I yeah. do? Well, um, you know, you got to understand the tradition of Vegas and musicians, the, the, the level of musicianship is extremely high. Right. You know, all those casinos that used to host different artists, you know, their quote unquote house bands. Now it could have been a 40 piece orchestra. They were in place and Tony Bennett would walk in and play with them and Sammy would walk in and play with them and Steve and Edie or, you know, back in those days. So, and these guys didn't miss. They were amazing readers, you know, like studio musicians. And so the tradition of musicianship and, and what you saw a lot of, you know, in the early 2000s around that time were kind of like the offspring of the cats that were doing it. So they all come from that tradition of very, very... Um, you know, very precise and very uh, um, just just spot on playing. You yeah. know, it was when we first got there in '01. Uh, the biggest name that was not a Siegfried and Roy because they were still on at the time, or a Penn and Teller. Uh, it was, and it was funny because one of the guys that I worked with at the radio station, we razzed him all the time. He was so huge on knowing the Shintas. Remember those guys? Sure. Yeah. Their, man, their uh, manager lived across the street from me, our first house. <laughs> and that was like that was like a family band. I mean, even some of the guys, um, I don't think he was in the family, but he played the drums. Um, yeah. But also, we saw this smiling guy with these, you know, pearly white chiclet teeth, Clint Holmes. <laughs> remember him? He's that guy. Larry's got to know him. You got to know him. I play with Clint, man. He's great. He's great. I mean, he was he was just an amazing band. And the yeah. funny thing is, my wife and I, we got married um, three months into us living there. And the weekend before that, she was going to fly back to Connecticut where we're from to get uh, the wedding all set up. Oh, yeah. uh, I was going to hang back for a month in Vegas. And um, we took a weekend and just took advantage of whatever the radio station could get us. And we said, hey, why don't we go see Clint? We've never seen Clint Holmes. We always thought he was just a Vegas lounge singer. Right. So we go uh, to Harris and we go sit down. We had front row tickets. And the woman who sat down next to us, we overheard her conversation. It was something like her 14th time seeing Right. Him. Right. And my yeah. wife and I, are, we're sitting there laughing, just going, are you serious, dude? Yeah. yeah. 14th. He came on stage and blew our faces yeah. off. That's it. I, I, and, I, he's great. He's a great yeah. performer. Yeah, I, I uh, had a different opinion of Vegas when I came mm -hmm. in and, and uh, ended up having a huge respect, you know. Yeah. Exceptional but players here. There was, a, there was an underlying joke with one of the Cirque shows that played at the Bellagio called O. Oh. Is it still there? Still there, yeah. It's still there? Okay. And uh, everyone said, well, why do they call it O? Well, <laughs> have you asked what the ticket prices are? And they go, oh. no. <laughs> then you'll find out. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so what are they like four or 500 bucks? Yeah. They're like, you know, that level of ticket. And it's, it's yeah. an amazing show. I've never seen it. I, we saw Mystere a few times. Right. We saw Zumanity. Uh, I don't think we saw the Beatles one. Mm. Um, we saw the, uh, I saw Ka. Mm -hmm. Ka was the, good, ship, yeah. the ship and everything. And I was a little uh, tired right. that night. I can't believe this guys, but I fell asleep at Ka. Really? Yeah. yeah I don't oh. know. It's, sorry. There was, <laughs> we, we, saw, <laughs> we saw one of the dress rehearsal nights of the Celine Dion show oh, when that came to sound. Nice. Actually, you know what? When uh, they would open Cirque, these new shows, they'd invite the artists to come watch a, a run through before they opened the show. And we went to see the Ka run through, and it was a huge, technically just a massive show, right? Yeah. And uh, there's one scene where it's a boat in the front of the stage doing this and they're doing acrobatics off the boat now it's brand new so nobody really knows what the hell they're doing um but my wife and i it's an empty theater so maybe i don't know 100 people artists you know maybe 200 
we go right down and sit front row. This is such a massive show. It's like, hey, let's freak out and check this out. <laughs> we sit in the front row, which is where this boat number is happening. And, it, and it's coming. And, and people are flying. And uh, we almost got creamed, man. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. Rich, it Rich, up. Have, I t- have I ever told you I auditioned for the Blue Man Group while I was out there? Hey. You didn't tell me that. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't really an official audition. They came on the radio station and were a part of our morning show. And uh, I told the guys in um, that were doing the morning show, I said, hey, why don't we have me on an aud- aud- audition for them right there on the air? And it was oh, like wow. the three main guys who started the, uh, the whole Blue right. Man group thing. And yeah. I, they brought me in and I had my little practice pad and I did the worst double stroke roll you could ever freaking do. <laughs> It was like, and they were like, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Sign them up. <laughs> well, the, well, well, the three guys right. up front are more actors, right? And they're all, it's all about their height and their look and their, you got to play. No, you got to play. But not as well as the guys in the back. Right. Oh no. The, one of the, one of the guys, guys the real cats. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. A lot of them were one of the guys, stars, you know, you know, it was a uh, uh, Bloss Elias. I think yeah. was one of them. Wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, from uh, Skid Row. Was it Skid Row? I think it was Skid Row. Skid Row. Yeah. yeah. Or Slaughter. I get those two confused. But yeah. no, you know. I got you confused. Know, yeah. What, how did that happen? You know who it's, else wanted to be a, a blue man? Jason Sudeikis, the comedian. Right. <laughs> he really? he's he wanted to do it, and he was just like, I just couldn't get the rhythmic thing down. That's it. That's the great equalizer. I know lots of guys have auditioned for that. I've gotten calls from friends, you know, hey, I'm going to audition for Blue Man. Like, teach me how to play drums. It's like, okay, uh, no. <laughs> teach me how <laughs> to play drums, not really? Not week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not it's in a not week. Right. No, it's not right. No, forget you it. You kind of got to know what you're doing, pal. That's not going to happen. So, Larry, just in case you're wondering, Jim doesn't live in a trailer. He's just camping with his family right now. Yeah, I mean, Sounds good. Sorry. <laughs> you got good Wi-Fi. You're you're good anywhere, man. That's mm-hmm. my. That's the way it is now. That that I is like man. I had to tell the kids to get off the uh, Netflix and the you know the social media because I got to do an interview. <laughs> it's like when I come in here and do lessons, it's like if it's messing up, I got to tell them to stop. Oh, because I have to. Yeah, the the Wi-Fi is. Uh, I have a good package, but when everyone's using it. You know, you get those bottlenecks, and boy, you got fiber out there, don't you? Nope, no. Really? No, you have. Wow. Did Nashville, get the Google Fiber. I have Google there? Fiber in my condo, but not out at the house. The house is on uh, Comcast. Right. We have fiber in Spring Hill. Wow. Mm-hmm. One gigabyte up and I, down. I got to yeah. double check on that. So, so Larry, the other thing that I w- wanted to just ask about was. Um, of all these other names, any interesting, incredible stories? Like, you know, when I look at names like Daniel Lenoir, or Rick Ocasek, or David Lee Roth, or something incredibly Which humorous. Which one? Who's the, oh, incredibly yeah. humorous. Because I, th- cause I feel like there's a there's a definitely a memoir in you at some oh, point. Oh God! Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to tell a Roth story. <laughs> so, did I tell you this one? Are you leading me down down that route? Is that? I- don't know. Oh, it's just that. They uh, lose rehearsed. here. Yeah, so we, we were rehearsing. I, I did a record for him, for Nile, actually. and uh, But then he, he he had a drummer he was going to tour with. And it didn't work out. And he called me, would you come and play with me? And uh, and I really wasn't the David Lee Roth drummer in my mind. But you don't say no. no you know, forget it, Dave. So I went and uh, we played for couple weeks and all that and i never did the tour ron ron wixo did it mm. killed it lives in austin no because it was funny yeah i know he's i love ron and uh the story goes that we get to an ending of a song and he, and you know and he turns around he's rehearsing he turns around and i'm like he's like oh, what the fuck? what is that and when i go like this i want you to symbol and I don't know how Dave want they how he ends this song, you know. So he starts screaming at me. Oh my like, god! Yeah, well, it's just the heat of the battle. So when we're in front of twenty thousand different people, what are we gonna do when I do this and you? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Huh? And he just and I'm just and F, and I'm kind of like smiling. Like, <laughs> huh? Huh? And I, <laughs> 
are you laughing at? <laughs> Come on, Abramans. <laughs> So we got to take the man. drummer to Starbucks. <laughs> it was great, man. No, we got it together. But it was <laughs> we had Ray yeah. Luzier on uh, a couple what, a couple months ago, right? Yeah, Rich? perfect, perfect. Yeah, so funny. And did you have to sing? Yeah, no, way? I didn't. And you know, it was just he was really trying to scale back, and and I don't sing. Uh, you know, I wasn't singing, and and he didn't want to use a keyboard player at that time, and it, yeah, it was. It was, uh, yeah. But that is just him screaming, what are we going to do now? And I'm like, like no tell problem. me. Just tell me what you want me to do. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell are you laughing at? <laughs> he may have had a, he was just having a bad day. No, he came back. He was, I'm so sorry, guys. You know. <laughs> no, I'm just sorry, lose year. <laughs> you know, that, that's Watch what that my episode. band likes. That the end of songs, you know, my band doesn't, yeah. we don't do, I don't, Jim, I don't know if you noticed, but our band doesn't do a lot of trash can endings. I mean, some bands, it's just a staple of song to song. Sometimes it's the glue that connects every song. Yeah. We don't do a lot. A lot of our songs are just, you know, you get to go, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, but occasionally, Farner, their endings are hilarious, man. It's like, bam, 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 bam. Have you ever had to do the Iron Maiden ending? No. <laughs> That's the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Exactly like that. They stole it from Kiss. The, yeah, I love going. The Iron Maiden ending. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Everything with them was gallop beats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Larry, you um, came and taught last year at my Nashville Drummers Weekend with Daru Jones and Joe Vitale. Yay! Hey, Joey. And <laughs> it was a great combination of teachers and students, and you and I just sat in all of our fellow oh. drummers, and you got up there and you performed, you played the tracks, you answered a lot of questions, you got deep, you got soulful, you got philosophical, you were pacing back and forth on the stage, you had the microphone, you were like a... You were like a real polite rant comedian. <laughs> and the, the, the kids loved it. They went, they, you basically took your entire career and you just like compressed it into some real gems of wisdom, man. And I appreciate it, man. Thanks for doing that. Man, it was amazing. I mean, I, I love events like that. And especially when you're with other drummers and you get to hang out. And, you know, I, I have a, a great picture of me and you watching uh, Daru play at one point and, and we're like the look, the look on our face yeah we're just like oh okay that's how that goes <laughs> yeah Damn. i stole i stole some i stole stuff from all of you guys man oh yeah and i you know i that that's the best part you know and you know i wanted to say like uh about your your background in education and all this other stuff that you're talking about and your but the most important thing for me when i think of you is that you lay it down like a dog when you play, Rough. your pocket is yeah, and that's so. That's the most important thing, you know. I, oh, I it doesn't it doesn't and it doesn't matter what style. It's just you got to have that core, like what I was talking about before, right? And and uh, and you have it, and you know that that's when I get to see guys like yourself or Daru or Joe Vitale, man. It's just you know the the real top pros that inspires me so much. It's you know when you're talking about being and growing up in New York and like going to see Steve Ferroni play live, you know, in a club. You guys you know? want to leave you, want me to leave you alone for a while or? Uh... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, 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 it's, but that's, that's so important to me, man. I know you were talking about that before and it's just like education is great, but, and, and, or whatever it is, but if you ain't keeping that pocket and, and, and laying it down, it doesn't, none of it means shit, you know? I, yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. You got to have that quarter note pulse and build upon that. Even if you're just like playing with a big band, I remember being playing in the big band and they were like, Rich, more left foot. We need that hi hat chopping uh -huh. away on two and four. There's 17 guys here that yeah. need to know where the time is. Right. Right. So before you start ding, ding, diggling and, and comping with the left hand, just exactly. get that thing going and then build from there. Yeah, that's it, man. You know, like El Negro, uh, when you watch him play, he plays an insane wall of sound, but the pulse or Giovanni, you know, it's just so complex. 
Gabbiani Udago, you know, just, but the time is like this, you know, it's like a freight train knocking you over. Mm. If you ain't knocking people was, over like a freight train, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care. You know? Well, it's like we Steve the, Jordan. Uh, he's he's got a meme floating around the internet now. Well, probably because of our, our friend Nick over at Drummer's Resource. If you haven't done his interview, you should definitely do it. But his he had a thing from Steve Jordan. Steve Jordan saying basically like, look at simple doesn't mean stupid. Oh yeah. Simple yeah. means people are gonna want to play music with you because you're not mucking up their song with your diddles. Yeah, yeah. That's what she said. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> and, the, um, you know. <laughs> and nobody, nobody's out there dancing the Dream Theater for crying out loud, right? Well, you know, some are, but Dream Theater, the point is Dream Theater plays a serious pocket. They yeah. do, you know? Um, but the co- a lot of bands that copy Dream Theater that miss the point that it has that, there was a, that's where the music gets, oh, wow, they, they suck. You know, I hate that. <laughs> no, there's... I, um, we had the honor or privilege of talking to Thomas Lang on Friday. Yeah. And, and he, uh, yeah. Rich, what did you get out of that? Did you learn a lick or two? Well, yeah. I mean, the guy's <laughs> playing, the guy's playing crashers, like a mounted crasher and a mounted snare drum with his left foot. In addition to the two hi hats on his left side, double bass pedals. And then there's other pedals over on the right side that, yeah. that are playing melodies. And then he's, playing very highly orchestrated choppy parts on top of that. Right. And it feels good. And I'm like, wow, this is a guy who has been practicing eight to 10 hours a day for 40 years. Boom. Period. You know, a lot of people like to think, oh, what a freak. Oh, Dennis Chambers. Oh, Thomas Lang. You know, like they woke up one day, Vinny Cagliuta. They woke up one day and they just had all these chops because they're geniuses. Now they yeah. are geniuses. They they okay. they do, but they're they have that genius uh, acumen. But they work their they ass work off. Anyone, man. The stories about Vinny at Berkeley, you know. I know guys that went to school there at that time, and my man used to just bring. They didn't have drum sets in the practice room. He would bring his drums in in the morning because they put them in lockers, set up cover the window of the practice room and he'd be in there for 12, 15, 14 hours a day. Working it out. Tony Williams, another example, you know, you know, Charlie Parker is one of the greatest musicians that ever lived, right? Changed music forever. Sure. And there's a famous art interview with him, uh, by Paul Desmond, the guy that played with Dave Brubeck, take five Paul Desmond. Yeah. And he's interviewing him and it's a really sweet interview. But then he starts talking about Bird's practice regimen. And Charlie Parker was saying, oh, yeah, when, when I was a kid, I used to practice 16 hours a day. Not a kid. I, I always, 16 hours a day. He said we would get thrown out of apartments because I was always playing saxophone. And, and Paul Desmond was like kind of shocked. He said, well, what did you practice? He said, well, this method book, this method, this thing. I mean, really high level learned stuff. Like, not just, you know, putzing around for 16, a very methodical, you know. So, yeah. But Paul Desmond was, like, surprised because he had that imp- that kind of impression because Bird is such a genius. Charlie Parker didn't practice. Like, he didn't have to practice. No. He, Every, Thomas and, Lang, man, that dude, I know he, you know, you know what it takes to get that going, and you can, or Marco Miniman. They practiced that. They didn't wake up one day, Terry yeah. Bozico, didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I, I can play five over 14. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me go get the Zabba gig. <laughs> no, yeah, no, absolutely, man. I remember hanging out with Chad Wackerman. We were talking about those Zappa rehearsals, and they would have to go into rehearsals for months because, the, as Frank wanted, everything – you know, shifting time signatures wanted everything memorized. And then to add another layer to it, they could take some of those sections at Frank's whim. He would have signs yeah. and they would have to do that section as reggae, country and Western, yeah. R&B. What? Yeah, yeah. It's like Prince. Prince, same thing. High level. You, you just, you know, you have to be down and and and... And those guys were, and that's why they're such standouts. George Duke, you know, he played with, he played with Zappa, but it's just it, the the musicianship was just on another level. So yeah. anything George Duke did, even if it was just the funk, like I'm back to this again. But <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> hard work, hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Hard work trumps everything, and I I do I do remember putting in the time years ago. And there's some guys that they they do 
continue that thing almost like a an obsessive nature all through their entire career. Thomas is one of them. Uh, yeah. He makes me feel guilty because I'm like, I just don't see myself using a double stroke roll on my with my feet, and I don't know if. Uh, you know, that I want to put that, it's a decision. Like, I don't know if I'm going to use that. Yeah. I mean, another interesting thing that was kind of off the topic, but I think it was, he was talking about that. He just decided not to play a uh, traditional grip anymore. Was that him? I just oh, saw really? something talk about that. Like, or he just switched. He chose one of them because it takes too much time to learn both at the same time and be virtuosic at the level he wants to be. Yeah, Jim, did he play traditional grip or was it all matched? I forget, we'll have to go look at the video. I I think it was matched. I think it may have been all matched. Well, his new solo record is all drum machine-istic. So it's like a tip of the hat to 80s drum machine program, which a lot of times was programmed by keyboard players and they made it very difficult for us. And so he had all these patterns and I think it was a lot of matched grip. Yeah. Well, we listened to one of his tracks and I said, so is your methodology listening back to your track and going, you know what? There's space there I, that I could fill. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's an aesthetic, too. That's like, uh, you know, I, I, at Zumanity, my last band director, I used to work with Marco Miniman. So he would oh, uh, write arrangements, and, and sometimes it was just mm. lots of notes, and a lot of space would get filled with it, mm. all those intricacies. And I was able to decipher them. It wasn't above me, but, it, yeah, sometimes it was just like, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> breathe yeah. breathe oh my gosh i actually yeah. listened to some of the tracks that thomas did and it's uh right it was it's it's a lot of like what you're talking about drum machine-esque stuff that keyboard players programmed but he's pulling it off as you know on the fly oh it's nuts amazing man. it is nuts so what you're telling me is that the uh half an hour that i practice every couple of weeks that's not enough but you have great joy. When you, you have great joy. You get on that thing, and and it's like, you yep. don't have to worry about making a living at it, and you just go bash it out. Yep. Which that's is really that's fun. The, that's the thing, you know. It's like if 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 you really do want to make a living playing music, well, who's that? Cool. That's my brother. That's my son. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's 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 just. The best quote I ever heard was, music is incredibly humbling. You know, people always challenge me to, to, to have to work harder. Um, so if you want a career in music, you just have to be willing to sacrifice, but also work like a, like a dog on yeah. your craft. And, it's, but, I don't know. If, it's a, if it's something that, that everybody else wants to do, it, you have to work that much harder at it. Oh, absolutely. And to be one of the best, it's just... You know, I think there's more competition money. ever, right? To do um, less available jobs. Less work. Oh, absolutely. Less available jobs that don't pay as well. Apparently. Yeah, how about that, man? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like all radio. In it's all in flux, you know. Um, <laughs> but I do believe the spirit of music always wins, you know. I do believe it, and I've seen it, you know. Um, it but the amount of, amount of people that will be able to sustain themselves purely playing music will be less, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also performing or doing music it takes it's taking it's taking on different forms you know so i don't well, know it's it's melding within the digital age especially it's melding with so many different things um i don't know <laughs> well it's funny because a lot of people um talk about the music business being you know so in flux and uncertain and everything and i go you know if you really think about it we're no different than we were in the 60s and 70s because a lot of the music was singles based and where are we now right singles singles based music Mm -hmm. so there's there's a possibility that down the road that you know albums could come back and that's the way you buy music eventually you never know well i think you know you know we're heading into like virtual reality stuff and uh, you know uh, i had a friend describe to me like 20 years ago maybe more about just the virtual reality studio or the virtual reality experience, but just the recording studios we was referring to. It's like you walk into a virtual reality room, you put on the suit or the gloves or whatever it is, and all the instruments of your dreams are there, which is kind of what's happening, right? You open Logic and it has the roads, the clap, and, the, and pretty decent facsimiles. But now he said you just reach up, grab the 59 Les Paul, you know, there's uh, AI assistance so you can perform your ideas without having that much to, you know, knowledge or whatever. 
you sit down and you play a great DW kit, you can play bass, you can have Quincy Jones produce it, you know, and things like that open up a lot of possibilities. Um, so I don't know. I just, uh, I, I try not to keep just like my finite mind and, and have contempt prior to investigating like, you know, what, right. you know, what can really happen here. So yeah. I think you're, you're never going to, you're never going to be out of a job, but I mean, cause you have a musical mind and you have the skill set and, and, a, and, and probably a very robust network after, you know, four decades, you know? Yeah. I mean, and the other thing is I also put, I, I, I've been teaching, so I'm working now, you know, through all this cause I'm yeah. still able to teach, but, uh, and, and, and teaching, you know, people put down like the whole online experience and all, but I mean, I've been telling students and anyone else that listen, if you really want to have a career in music, you're going to have to get a, a room like this and mic it up. And cause I don't know when that time is coming, but it's, it's, it's coming quick where we're all going to be in real time and able to play from our rooms. And, and uh, so get your studio chops, get your engineering, get your production, you know, that turns you into a, a, a songwriter, you know, all the things that you're doing too, Rich, which enables you to have a career. Yeah. You're a drummer, you do your production and some kind of a drummer percussionist point of view, which is very valuable. We don't yeah. think like guitar players, you know, we, yeah. So, well, I, I love people so much. I feel like music is like, like many of the things that I just love in life um, yeah. is a team sport. And yes, I could probably get to the point where I don't need my friend and drum tech, John Hole, but we go in, I'm like, all right, over the next two days, we're doing 23 songs and right. you're engineering because I just want to focus on the performance. Right. Um, but so even in that environment, I'm still working with someone i just love people man mm. you know yeah no i'm missing people now that's yes sure. and that's the one thing that's great about ensemble playing and music and all but you know i te i'm teaching a lot and, and the students young or old you know they're they're kind of comfortable in this you're over there and i'm over here so they really are they're getting used to it well if people want to find you very easy it's larry and that's a b e r man aberman.com and on the instagram where all the kids are your handle is larry aberdrum and uh everybody follow larry because i don't know there's there's some people on there but we need more people because larry is a treasure he's a national treasure so you got to get on there he's always posting great stuff now this is my one of my favorite parts of the show larry we do the random question of the day and we even have a jingle it's the random question random question random question of the day i have a uh let's see one that's very along the lines of what we're talking about and the other one is actually something i think i may go with so here we go hmm. What is your go-to joke? Oh my God! All right, it's it's. Well, I've been effing and bombing all this whole thing, so I'm gonna go for it, man. <laughs> this is gonna knock your socks off. So two flies, right? There's there's kind of standing on a piece of crap. Nice. They're just standing there. One of them lets out a fart. Oh my God! The other fly looks at him and goes, "Do you see? I'm trying to eat over here." <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god see i told you dude i'm at the condo i don't have a splash and blow i really That's should have a go-to joke bro i got a cajon <laughs> over a here good. you see i'm trying to eat i have, I have a good one okay i just heard this from my my wife who heard it from her brother so my brother-in-law uh, right. bear walks into a bar bar sits down at the bar and the bartender says what I'll, what do i get you he says i will have a grilled cheese and the bartender asks why the big pause he says i'm a bear <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> got any grapes you know that one right delayed delayed delay, delayed reaction yeah. <laughs> what's the grapes what's the grapes one uh doc walks into a bar hops up on the bar looks at the bar a bartender and says hey you got any grapes Bartender says no i don't have any grapes get out of here Buck Duck comes back the next day. John's like, hey, you got any grapes? Bartender says, you were here yesterday. We don't have any grapes. Beat it. Get out of here. Hops up in the bar next day. You got any grapes? He said, look, man, don't come in here and ask for grapes anymore. I don't have any grapes. Get the hell out of here. Next day, Duck walks in the bar, jumps up on the bar, looks at him and goes, hey. Oh, he's, 
before he, he leaves the third day, the third time the bartender said, you come in here asking for grapes again, and nail your feet to the bar. The next day the bar, the duck jumps up on the bar and says, hey, you got any nails? He goes, no. Cool. You got any grapes? <laughs> <laughs> and I blew that one. I was on a roll. Oh. So, hey. Oh, yeah. Hey, no, you're a better joke teller than I am because I have a hard time memorizing those type of like, but you guys are ready for the cat skills. I mean, you really are. <laughs> well, it wasn't far from there for a while, so. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, the cat hey, skills. You know, what we forgot about Larry is that in between, you know, you're coming from Philly and then your education in New York and then all the stuff, and you lived in Los Angeles for a long time too, right? Yeah, for like eight years. Yeah. Uh, um, I toured a lot while I was in LA. I toured with Joe Sample. I toured with Jonathan Brook, um, John Taylor from Duran Duran, and, and uh, so I was home. I was kind of in and out a lot. Yeah. You know, in Los Angeles, and, and also the first couple of years, I was I still kept my place in Brooklyn, um, and I had a place in on Mel, like Melrose area because it reminded me of New York, I guess. Yeah. But after a while, I just got tired of. Uh, I, I was working more in Los Angeles, and I just I would get off the plane, and the, the car would drop me in my place and put the bags down. It was so quiet. <laughs> you know, compared to New York, especially oh where God. I live in Brooklyn, I was just like, I, I think I'll stay here for a while. Yeah, West Hollywood is very quiet. My God. No, not at all. But comparatively, man, New York is a trash trucks and the subway. I, you know, I lived in Brooklyn underneath the, the bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, there's a truck, the trains going across. And the, yeah, it's different. It, experience. It's almost like a, a city music that puts you to sleep. It's like when I get on the bus and then the generator starts up and the wheels start rolling, I'm just like, out. Oh, the bus was great. I agree. Except in the snow and you're, and you're blessed with a top bunk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, and that bus Why starts to miss. Oh, it's the, you can feel the bus skidding in the snow and the top bunks at the top and the bus is kind of wobbling and you, <laughs> there's no sleeping. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're lucky that we, the last, uh, God, maybe the last decade, we've been in um, condo bunks where it's instead of 12 yeah. Three, 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 three. It's two, 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 two. And so there's oh, more yeah. room. I've been on buses like that too. Yeah. But you know, you start off, man, my first tour, I remember the first, first tour, we had a bus. This thing was from 1958 or something. And, and it was <laughs> suited for, had bunks, but they were just these panels that kind of went like this and they put a chain and so you could, and it had pads and you could sleep on that. We called it Elvis's bus, like because it was Elvis. It was, probably was Elvis's. Probably bus. was Elvis's Back. bus. Yeah, and they got better, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, man, it's just what an inspiring conversation. I always love seeing you. You know, you're a dear pal. You've changed the music business, and the kids that you're uh, educating are uh, very, very fortunate. I hope they realize that. And so, all the folks out there at LarryAberman dot com. Follow him on Instagram, Larry Aberdrum. And uh, Jim has something to say, I believe. Hmm. No, I was just giving a thumbs up. Oh, thumbs he's up. just giving you the old fashioned thumbs up. up. I love it, man. <laughs> well, man, I, I, I do hope to, I hope this all goes away. We could visit soon, man. Yeah, that's uh, most of all. It's just been fun hanging with you and, and nice to meet you, Jim. You know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, I've been missing, you know, just like we would go out for coffee and whatnot and just, just shooting the shit with guys, man. And Yeah. Just hanging out, and um, yeah, we'll get there for sure. That, I can see that coming. So. We will get there, man. Well, man, yeah. I do appreciate it. I know all the listeners are sure, sure loving this, and uh, thanks to our sponsors, the School of Rock. As always, thanks to everybody for listening, watching. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, share. Tell your friends. You got questions? You got concerns? You got praise for us? I got an email address: the Rich Redmond Show at Gmail dot com. And as always. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.